We're going to read the first seven verses. The story goes that, in fact, let me say this before I say the story. God has a way of letting our lies catch up with us. The story goes of a, a pastor who uh, had a very busy program. So he decided to take the Sunday that was coming off. So what he did, he, he took it off because he wanted to go and play golf, by the way. <laughs> so what he decided to do, he called up the elders in the church, said, listen, I've been invited in another part of the uh, uh, country to go and uh, preach. I can't show up this Sunday, so I've arranged for somebody else to step in my place and, and preach because I can't preach at my church. I have to be in another church to preach, so they'll be there. So that following Sunday came and, and God is looking down from heaven and this pastor is on the golf course is about to tee off and, 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 and hit the, the, the golf ball and God looks at one of the angels and says, come here, I'm going, to show, I'm going to teach this guy a lesson. So the guy hits the golf ball, it flies and it becomes a hole in one. In other words, his first shot gets straight into the hole. Those, these shots, are, they're not impossible, but they're very, very rare. He gets a hole in one and he's excited like, whoa, I got a hole in one. So he tees off to do it again. He hits it again and there's another hole in one. And he keeps on getting hole in one after hole in one after hole in one after hole in ones. So the angel is watching this and think, what's going on? He can't take it anymore. He says, God, I thought you're going to teach this guy a lesson. What's going on? And God smiled up and God looked at him and says, you know what? Up till now, this guy has never, ever got a hole in one in his entire life. And he says, who is he going to tell? Think about this in the entire church. <laughs> when we forget who we are, nothing brings us back to reality quicker than the truth. And here is this pastor tonight. He forgot who he was. And he was shown the truth about himself. And tonight I want to preach a sermon I simply called the truth about ourselves. And I want God, amen, to help us. And can he tonight even show us the truth about ourselves? I mean, let's read Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 1 to verse 7 tonight, very well known. If you read your Bible, you would know this account, very powerful. And I pray we are all going to be, um, we are going to meet with God and, and leave here, amen, encouraged, amen, and, and strengthened, amen. The Bible tells us in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and lifted up, and the trail of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphims, each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes has seen the king the lord of hosts then one of the seraphims flew to me having in his hands a live coal which he had taken with the tongues from the altar and he touched my mouth with it and said behold this has touched your lips your iniquity is taken away and your sin Purged. Father, tonight we are grateful again that you would uh, uh, be with us, Lord, in this time, God, as we gather in your name. Father, tonight I'm asking once more you would take the coals from the altar of heaven uh, and cleanse our lips cleanse our lives. Father, help us to be men and women who are fitting before you. Meet for the master's use. Men and women, God, that has been cleansed and are bringing glory to your name. I'm praying for anyone tonight who is not saved, who is not right with you. Father, save them by the power of your spirit and by your great love. I'm praying tonight for all those, God, Father, who are not right, Father, in their spirits. Father, we'll humble ourselves, repent, oh God, and so you may bring healing, Lord God. Father, I'm praying tonight, God, you would use your servant to deliver this word again be glorified in this wonderful place we give you thanks in jesus mighty name and all god's people said amen and amen so tonight i want us to first of all let's consider uh truth let's consider truth 
In the Gospel of John, chapter 18, there is a powerful dialogue going on between Jesus and Pilate. And the Lord is being questioned by this man. And if you read the account, you will be able to tell that Pilate is enthralled by Jesus Christ. He's never met a man like him. In fact, uh, uh, just before that, uh, uh, when the, uh, uh, the, the chief priest had sent uh, 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 their soldiers to try and put their hands on Christ, the Bible says they came back and uh, priests were angry why didn't you arrest him and they said that no man spake no man spoke like this man there is something about Jesus Christ there's something about his countenance there's something about his word there's something about who he is that challenges and arrest him in people's presence and here is Pilate he's a powerful man he's a he's a man amen who is in charge of that area amen and the Bible tells us he's caught up in the Lord Jesus Christ and they're having this conversation tonight and he poses a violent to question him in John 18. In John 18, chapter 37 and 38, the Bible says, Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightfully that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now listen to verse 38. Pilate said to him, what is truth? You're here to bear witness of the truth. Everyone who's of the truth hears your voice. What, what, what exactly is truth? Now, in a world that is filled with lies, it is easy to understand why Pilate is asking this question. Amen. In a world amen, that was perverse then and is even much more perverse now, amen, it is easy to understand why this man is asking the question, what exactly is truth? Because truth has become very murked. It has become very dark. It is no longer right or wrong. It's what you feel. It's no longer black or white. Amen. It's now all gray. And tonight, if we're going to define truth, it is helpful to know what truth is not. Number one tonight, truth is not simply whatever works. Truth is not practice, pra pragmatism. It's not a case of tonight, amen, uh, uh, the ends and the means. And many people say, well, the ends justifies the means. And how I get things doesn't matter as long as how I get it in the end. That's not what truth is tonight, uh, amen, because truth uh, can appear to work, uh, but it's still a lie tonight uh, because it's not the truth. Number, number two tonight, uh, truth uh, is not what makes people feel good. I know bad news can be true tonight. Truth tonight, amen, is not a, a, what the majority of people say because you can have 51% of people and they're completely wrong. Truth tonight, amen, is not a, how we know, amen. Truth is what we know and truth is not simply what is believed tonight because a lie believed is still a lie. Let me tell you what truth is tonight. Truth never changes. Two plus two is four. You count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having uh, uh, my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him. How many of you want to know him tonight? Paul says that I may know him. In our text, we meet a prophet, and he's one of the big three. His name is Isaiah. In the Bible, you have major prophets and minor prophets. Isaiah is one of the big three. You have Isaiah, you have Jeremiah, and you have Ezekiel. They are the major prophets. And here is this man tonight, amen. He's a prophet, amen, and he's a good man. The Bible tells us the prophet tonight. But even good men tonight, from time to time, they need a reality check. Israel is sinning, and Uzziah, man, has been judged by God. He's dead, and judgment is going to come upon the land of Israel, and everything raveling him uh, uh, before Isaiah. So he does uh, what you would expect him to do. He goes to the temple. You could say he goes to the church uh, and he's wondering what's going on. The king is dead. Uh, 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 there's a judgment uh, of God that is coming. Uh, and what he couldn't make sense of, uh, because here it is, he wants to get close to God. Uh, what he couldn't make sense of tonight uh, was God was going to use a pagan nation to judge Israel. And in his mind, listen to me, God, we are your covenant people. They are a 
pagan people. God, we have, we have made a covenant with you. And yes, we are bad, but they are far worse than we are. Why are you using this pagan people? Why are you using this pagan nation to judge your people? And here he is, Isaiah tonight. He just wanted to check in the temple and find out tonight if God was still on the throne, because this simply cannot be right. It doesn't make sense. God, how, why are you letting them? How could you let them? It's, no, no, no. This cannot be God, that God is allowing a pagan nation to judge his people. Tonight, part of coming to know God intimately is hearing the truth about ourselves. Listen to me tonight. There is a preacher who one Sunday, he asked his congregation to read the gospel of Mark chapter 17. He says, I want you to read the gospel, Mark chapter 17, for the following Sunday. The following Sunday came and the pastor stood behind the pulpit and said, how many people read Mark chapter 17? And many people lifted up their hands. And he says, Mark chapter 17 only has six chapters. I felt like doing that here. I was, I was scared to say, what would happen? How many people read Mark chapter 17? It's only got six chapters, folks. And the pastor says, I'm going to preach a sermon about the truth. Tonight, church, we need someone to tell us the truth tonight. We don't do this with each other because we don't tell people the truth because we don't want to offend them, nor do we want to make them mad at us tonight. See, the truth is that all of us like to be lied to on occasion. The truth is from time to time, we don't mind. Can I use the term a little white lie, even though it doesn't exist? We like people that no woman tonight wants to go to somebody, whether male or female, and say, how do I look in this dress? And they look at you and say, you know, I've never seen a worse dress upon you in my life. No, they don't want to hear that. You know, yeah, they, we, we, want, we, we don't mind a little lie from time to time. Nobody wants to hear like tonight, amen. Even though we think it is the worst dress, even though we think it is the worst hairstyle, we don't want to say so because we don't want people to tonight amen, to hear the truth. And this is where God comes in tonight. Tonight, God calls it as he sees it. God's not going to tell you tonight he's cool and you're cool tonight. God tonight is going to look at you and tell you you're dead in your trespasses and your sins. He's going to tell you you need to get your heart right. And tonight, our God is not going to make it comfortable for you, nor convenient for you. Isaiah goes to the temple and God is going to reveal his truth. And God begins to reveal himself. And when God reveals himself tonight, who he is, this revealing also reveals who we are. See, the truth about ourselves is revealed in the truth about him. And we see three things. Number one tonight, Isaiah, he saw God was alive. In verse one, the Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Sometimes because of what's happening in our lives or what's not happening in our lives, we think that God is dead. Israel has always been a nation that wanted to be like other nations. They wanted to have a king like other nations. And when they brought this before God, God says, this is a bad idea. You guys should not have another king, have an, a king like other nations because I'm your king. And they kept on pushing the envelope. They kept on pressing the matter. And finally, the Bible tells us uh, they get, amen, Saul. Uh, then they get David. Uh, then they get Solomon. Uh, and it keeps on going on and on and on till we come to Uzziah. Tonight, listen to me. We have placed our hopes in something. Uh, and many times, amen, we ask God to bless uh, that which we've placed our hopes in. Uh, and when things don't go our way, God is dead. Here is King Uzziah tonight. King Uzziah is dead. The people had put their hope upon this man. And this man is the king. This man is a, he, amen, he is a light, you could say, amen, of Israel tonight. But now he's dead. But church, God was still alive. Tonight, God is the everlasting God. And God has always been alive tonight. And church, he will always be alive. Our God will never die. In fact, our God cannot die. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 19, 90 verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth or ever, you have formed the earth and the world from even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. 
Here is Israel. They literally begged for an earthly king, but every earthly king is going to die one day. Church, our God is going to live forever. Our God will never expire. Our God will never come to the end of himself. Our God, amen, will never fail tonight. And the truth tonight is many people have picked the wrong king. The second thing he saw, he saw that God was high and lifted up. Now, this is the view God sees from. God sees from the viewpoint that is high and lifted up. How many of you know tonight, when you're on a mountain, everything seems like the same size? When you're on a mountain and you look down, everything is on the same level. See, we don't see the whole picture with life. We don't see the whole picture with the decisions that we make, but even more so with the decisions that God makes, that what he chooses to do or what he chooses not to do. And here is Isaiah tonight. Isaiah is wondering, God has got this completely wrong. God, I can't see this. I don't understand it. God, for once, you have messed up. This cannot be right. That you're the, Number one, the king is dead, but now you're going to use this pagan nation to judge your people. And he's thinking tonight in Isaiah's mind that maybe tonight God has got it wrong. Then he sees God's viewpoint. He sees that God sees everything. Here it is, that God sees past, present, and future at the same time. That God sees that there's nothing that God does not see. That God sees, has the whole book. That God knows the end from the beginning, not the beginning from the end. God knows, I mean, how it is all going to play out and work out. And he says tonight that God is on the throne. You see, even though that Uzziah had lost his place on the earthly throne, God was still on his rightful place on the throne, seated upon the throne of heaven. Many times, I mean, I've seen t-shirts of girls wearing, you know, girls rule. Or sometimes boys have t-shirts saying boys rule. Can I say something tonight? Our God rules tonight. That is not some man. It's not some woman. It's not some bickering back and forth tonight. He's in absolute control of everything. Lastly, he saw that God was holy. He's in heaven. He gets a, vi a picture of heaven and there are seraphims there. There are, there are angels there with one ministry for all eternity. They are going to be in the presence of God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come for all eternity. Holy, holy. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is. Listen, before time began, these angels were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is. For all, listen to me, it's not a case that one day they're playing the drums, and the next day they're teaching the Sunday school, and the next day they don't, listen to me, for just one ministry was to say, holy, holy, holy. It's not a case of pastor. I'm tired of doing this. I don't want to do this anymore. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to step back. No, no, no. For all eternity, holy, holy. It's not a case of, well, I found something better. I want to go up and because, you know what, people don't appreciate me, so I'm going to step back. Someone spoke to the wrong way. No, no, no. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. For all eternity, they are doing this. Tonight, holy means completely pure. Holy means 100% perfect. Holy means set apart. And tonight, God is holy. He's unlike anything else tonight. He's on a category all by himself. He's on a league all by his own. I want you to think about this tonight, church. Everything in the world can be put into a category. Think about it tonight. I want to think about a poodle. Think about a Labrador. And think about him in a beagle tonight. What category are they in? They're dogs. Think about a crocodile. Think about a lizard. Think about a snake tonight. Uh, what category are they in? They're reptiles. What category can you put God? What can you compare him to? Who can stand next to him and be his equal? God is on a category all by himself. God is in a league all by himself tonight. Listen to me. There is nothing else holy. There is nothing else perfect like him. 
And here is the seraphim tonight. They are repeating this word, amen, three times for all of eternity because it is important we understand tonight that holy tonight is the best word you could ever have to use to describe who God is. He is holy, he is holy, he is holy. And here's Isaiah, he gets to heaven and he says, okay, God is still in charge. Okay, he still has the power. But here's the question tonight. Has God changed his mind about how he views sin? Has God come to a place where somehow he's comfortable with sin? That somehow now he's okay with sin? That maybe a man in the first century he was vexed with it, but in 2020, God has got with the times and you know what, you know, maybe a little bit of sin, I don't mind. Let me tell you how God feels about sin tonight. It's found in verse 3. Holy. 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 See, when something is mentioned three times in sequence tonight, it is to show the size of his holiness. Listen, church, he's not just holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's holy. He's not just, just, just God. He is God Almighty. So let's consider Isaiah's revelation tonight as we close. In verse 5, he's come before the throne of God He's, in, he's had this vision. He sees heaven. God's on the throne. He sees the seraphims declaring the holiness of God. The temple is shaking. Heaven is shaking. And in verse 5, it's like Isaiah's watching all of this. And in verse 5, listen to what he says. Is, so I said, woe to me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What is the truth about ourselves? I'll tell you what the truth about ourselves is. We are not as great as we think we are. We are sinners, folks. Let's never forget that tonight. We are sinners in need of the grace and the mercy of a holy God. See, before God can really use you tonight, he's going to tell you who you are. This is the problem Peter had when he met Jesus. In Luke chapter 5, verse 5 to 8, I want you to see this tonight because this is so important and we never forget this. In Luke 5, verse 5 to 8, the Bible says, But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled, we have worked all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. And when he had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And their nets was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Do you know tonight what I think? I think that Isaiah thought he was okay. After all, he's a prophet. A prophet is the best of all men. Right? I thought he came to a place, I'm all right. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. And tonight, God told him the truth about himself. You're dirty. You need cleansing, son. You're not as good as you think you are. So the good thing about God tonight, the good news about God tonight, is God doesn't just tell us the truth about ourselves and leave you where you are. See, like a good doctor tonight, he tells you you're sick so you can begin to seek proper treatment. And tonight, for many of us who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the proper treatment and the only treatment is salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, that he has provided forgiveness for our sins by his death upon the cross. This is the only remedy for sin. This is the only, this is the only treatment for the sin sickness that has infected much of humanity, all of humanity tonight. Right here, we're introduced to atonement. Atonement simply means at one mint. How we become one with God again. The Bible tells us the altar was the place of atonement. I want you to picture this. Here is a man. My, I, 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 my, my, I, woe unto me, for I am done, undone. I have unclean lips, and, 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 and I'm, I dwell amongst the clean people. My eyes have seen the king, uh, the Lord 
of hosts. He's in the very presence of God. He, he is a sinner tonight, uh, and he's confessing that he's a sinner tonight. Uh, and here is a man that knows uh, before holy God that he is sinful tonight. Uh, then he begins to confess that he's sinful. And as he confesses uh, that he's sinful, at the, at the very height of his sinfulness, he says, it's my mouth. How does a prophet function through his mouth? How does a prophet live or bake his living through his mouth? How does a prophet minister and use his ministry through his mouth? And he says, at the very place, it's my mouth. And he begins to confess this. He begins to speak this out before God. And the Bible tells us tonight, is at that moment of deep and honest repentance, in that moment of confession, that is seraphim, one of the ones that was saying holy, I want you to deep this tonight. One of the ones that was saying holy stops what he's doing to continue. He goes, he goes to the very presence of God where the altar is. He takes a coal, takes one of the tongues, takes a coal, flies, goes to Isaiah and puts it. Next time you have a barbecue in summer. <laughs> Up, get one of them tongues and grab them red hot coals and put it by your face and Jesus is Lord, put it inside right there. They took the coal and and the Bible says at that point he's cleansed. Tonight we need cleansing folks. We need deep cleansing. Verse 7 says he touched my mouth with it and he was cleansed. Church we need a coal from the altar. Let me say like this, we need a touch from God. We need to be pure tonight. We need, we need God, to, and only God can do that. This is a burning call from the altar of God. Amen, it was a symbol that God was the only one who could make Isaiah pure. Can I say tonight, God is the only one who can make you and I pure tonight. Nothing else can. No one else can do this tonight. And I want to close by simply making a statement tonight. God is not looking for perfect people. Can you say amen tonight, church? You know what he's looking for? He's looking for purified people. And he is the only one that can purify us. And the good news is he's ready and willing to do so. If you and I will come to this place and say, God, you know what? I'm not as good as I think I am. I haven't got it together as well as I think I do tonight. And God will step in. And God will bring a purification that will cleanse us so we can be in his presence and do what he's called and created us to do. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes tonight. Amen. <laughs>